Hey guys, my name is Pastor Ernie, and uh, I'm the family pastor here at Hope Community Church. And today I'd just like to share with you a little Easter devotion that uh, we hope you'll do with your family on Saturday before Easter Sunday. Saturday without Jesus. Our scripture day comes from Psalms 31, 9 and 14. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in distress. Tears blur my eyes, but I am trusting you, O Lord. Then John 19, 38 through 42 says, Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial customs, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so because it was a day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, can you imagine the thoughts of Jesus' disciples the day after he was crucified? I mean, I'm sure that their minds were filled with questions. Their hearts must have been anxious. I mean, they were a hunted people. They felt alone, facing the hostility of the Jewish leadership. As Jesus had already prophesied, his sheep had been scattered. You know, when we go to Holy Saturday, the story slows down dramatically. So much happened on Good Friday, but now, they laid Jesus in the tomb, and that was it, because it was Friday. Sundown started the observance of the Sabbath, and so after burying Jesus' body, they just went home for the day of rest. We don't talk much about Holy Saturday because nothing really happened on that day. Peter described Christ preaching to those who were now dead during that time, but here on earth, things were quiet. Sandwiched between the horror of Good Friday and the joy of Easter Sunday was a day of mourning, a day in the tomb. You know, these were the moments that inspired Swiss painter Eugene Birdman to paint Holy Saturday. And in this brilliant painting, three of the disciples sit while the other eight stand nearby. All their faces were serious and even grim. Much of the focus seemed to be on Peter, pictured on the far right who had his face buried in his hands. He was overcome with emotion. He was pondering the sad reality that he had denied even knowing Jesus just a few hours earlier. These men could not have known that everything would change again within a matter of days, that Jesus would rise from the grave, that they would be sparked with power when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, that this feeling of hopelessness would be replaced by victory because we already know the resurrection's coming. We tend to just skip over Holy Saturday and move straight from the cross to the empty tomb. But what if we took a day to reflect on what it must have been like for the disciples, Jesus' friends and followers, on the day before that first Easter morning? They were likely in shock. They were confused, maybe even afraid for their own lives. Would Jesus' enemies chase them down now? Or since their leader had been eliminated, would they no longer be considered a threat? Maybe they were angry or in despair. Or maybe they were just numb. They likely had no idea what they were going to do now. For three years, their whole lives had been about Jesus. And suddenly, just like that, he was gone. And perhaps more than anything, they were grieving. I mean, they had just buried their Messiah, their rabbi, their hero, and their friend. You know, when we rush too quickly to Easter morning, we miss the very real feelings of the disciples and all those who loved Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, who had been afraid to go public about his faith in Jesus, man, he's now asking Pilate if he could have Jesus' body. Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night out of fear of what his fellow Pharisees would think, going with Joseph to bury Jesus, he brought 75 pounds of myrrh and spices much more than was needed to prepare the body. And this was perhaps 100 times costlier than the perfume that we read about that Mary had anointed Jesus' feet with. See, neither of them was being secretive about their devotion to Jesus anymore. Of course, we know that he would rise again, but there's something to be said for sitting in the sadness, as Jesus did with Mary and Martha when Lazarus died. See, Jesus knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead in just a matter of minutes, and yet he wept with them, it says in John 11:35. 35. Even though he knew the end of the story, 
It says Jesus was deeply moved in, in spirit and troubled when he saw Mary's sorrow. It was an authentic, heart-wrenching weeping. You see, the images in Bernadette's painting, they symbolize life for every believer. The moments when we recognize our human nature, just how helpless we are without Jesus. See, when we realize the impact of sin, when we consider the mistakes that we've made, when we see how unworthy we really are, then just as it did for the disciples, the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, man, it changes everything for us. So today, think about what life would be like without Jesus. Remember how wonderful it is to have your sins forgiven, to trust in Him, to celebrate His glorious resurrection. Overwhelming victory is yours because of Him. And so on this holy Saturday, let's take a moment to be deeply moved in our spirits and troubled about the death of Jesus and all the pain and suffering that our sin has caused. Even though we know He rose again, it's still deeply troubling that He had to die first. It's deeply troubling that any of us must die. The more literal meaning of the word for deeply moved is indignant or moved with anger. Jesus wasn't just sad with Lazarus' death. He was angry. God hates death. It was not part of his design. It's what happens as a result of sin. It's right to grieve and to mourn over death, over suffering and over pain and over brokenness, over all the consequences of sin in this world. See, we do not grieve as those who have no hope, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4. But there's a time to mourn and a time to lament. Take some time to reflect on the pain and the suffering in this world and to lament the brokenness and sin in this world. Take some time to reflect on the ways that Scripture describes God's forgiveness. What does true forgiveness look like? I mean, practically, in our lives. How does Scripture describe those who have received God's forgiveness? Pray with me, if you will, here. Uh, Lord God, your son gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit on. God, give us grace to accept joyfully the suffering of, of this present time, confident of the glory that all shall be revealed through Jesus Christ, who lives and who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So we've got a, a discipline practice on lamenting that we want to talk to you about. Some of us seemed almost afraid to lament as Christians. You know, we tend to think that if we love and trust Jesus, then all our worship services, all our prayers, even all of our life should be happy and positive, but that's not the model of Scripture or of Jesus Himself. Did you know that over a third of the Psalms are laments? That these are the songs that Israel used regularly to worship? They didn't shy away from expressing frustration or anger or sorrow to the Lord. The biblical witness is to pour out our deepest, most raw emotions to God and to lament. But it always ends in an expression of trust. We see that in Psalms 42. A lament that didn't end in turning our eyes towards God in hope and trust wouldn't be a lament. It would be a, a more of a gripe session, right? To practice lamenting today, share the pains of your heart openly with God. Share your frustrations and sorrows, your grief, your remorse, your disappointments, and your doubts. Feel free to let it all out. See, God can handle it. Then end your prayer in a commitment to trust the Lord, to turn your eyes towards Him in hope. Here are a few more scriptures that I encourage you to look up as a family and read out loud. Psalms 31, Romans 12, 15 through 18, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and 1 Peter 4, 1 through 8. I hope you have a blessed Easter filled with happiness, love, and faith. We hope to see you all Sunday morning to celebrate and worship our risen King. And remember, the best Easter is one spent with your peeps.